I've been collecting mini PCs this year and the good ones typically follow the same formula. An AMD APU, low power consumption, in a tiny form factor. But what if there was a mini PC that had discrete graphics and lots of space for storage while being almost free of the bounds of power consumption and form factor, but at the same time conform to both of those bounds? Well, the answer may be this, the ROG NUC 970 with its little secrets, but to find out what they are, we need to take a little bit of a closer look. The ROG NUC 970 is using one of the new Intel Core Ultra mobile processors and it comes in two flavors. This one right here is the top spec version with the Intel Core Ultra 9 185H. And it's also got the GeForce RTX 4070 laptop GPU. We'll come back to that. But yeah, it does have a discrete GPU. What else has it got? On the front of the ROG NUC 970, there's an SD card reader, two USB type A ports. These are both USB 3.2 ports and a headphone jack. On the back, there are two USB 3.2 type A ports, two USB 2.0 type A ports, 2.5 gigabit ethernet, Thunderbolt 4 with DisplayPort 2.1 alt mode, an HDMI 2.1 port, two DisplayPort 1.4 A ports, and the DC power input. Let's pop the NUC 970 open. There's a single screw on the back side of the enclosure, and it's a captive screw. And what you want to do is loosen that and then slide the top of the case forward. So you can get a bit of a close look at everything that makes the NUC 970 tick. First of all, you notice there will be some thermal pads for the three M.2 slots on the board. Now this unit was sent to me from ASUS with all of these drives and RAM in here. I don't know why it wasn't peeled. It is a little bit strange, but at the end of the day, uh, probably not a huge deal. Anyway, there are two M.2 slots on the board that are right next to each other. All the M.2 slots on this board are PCIe Gen 4. And these M.2 slots use what we've seen on a lot of ASUS boards. They use clips now, so there's no screws to install any drives. And the primary PCIe slot, well, at least the one that had the drive installed, which is labeled number three, has this little clip here. This is the other style that you will typically find on these ASUS boards. Taking the drive out, you'll see the Wi-Fi 6E adapter with the two cables coming off for the antenna connectors. This just means that if you really wanted to, you could upgrade the Wi-Fi card at a later stage. This is a pre-configured version of the NARC 970 with 32 gigs of RAM and the one terabyte drive as already shown. And as you can see here, it's just regular sodium memory. This is DDR5 sodium. And like many other laptops, it's got a clip on each end of the slot and you can pop the memory up and then pull it out. But yeah, we're not going to be doing that right now. What we want to do is remove all of the screws that hold the motherboard into the chassis. So we can take a bit of a closer look at the cooling solution for the NUC 970. You can see there is a massive copper heatsink at the top, which cools both the CPU and the GPU. Overall, this is a pretty beefy cooling solution for a mini PC. The GPU, I think, takes up most of the cooling. You can see here, there is a massive cold plate and then a copper heat pipe that goes over the top of the memory modules as well to help cool that whole graphics card because it does have dedicated memory. It's also got two intake fans on the bottom, which are a blower design. So it'll pull the air in from the bottom of the chassis here and then exhaust it straight out the back of the enclosure. Again, look at that heatsink. It is absolutely huge. Now, it's hard to put this into perspective in video, but this is a very, very heavy and dense solution. So I would suspect that there's a lot more thermal headroom here. The NUC 970 weighs around 2.6 kilograms out of the box and the internal volume is around about 2.5 liters. Not that it matters because it's a mini PC, but I know someone's going to ask. The NUC 970 can be oriented either laying flat or stood up on the included stand in a vertical orientation to save desk real estate. Speaking of real estate, I got to be real with you guys. I've noticed a huge shift in PCs and I think huge is maybe the wrong word here. What I think I'm trying to say is that people want smaller PCs. I'm much the same. Recently, you may or may not have seen this, but I've downsized my own gaming PC to MATX and all of the editing PCs that I use are rack mounted to save space. But I've always had this eternal struggle with trying to find the perfect PC for the living room that can play games and something that I don't want to use a console for. Mini PCs are fine for lower end stuff, but 
What if I want to run games at much higher settings? All right, here we are with Shadow of the Tomb Raider at 1080p. This one is typically good at exposing weaknesses with graphics cards, and you can see that even at 1080p, it is well behind the rest of the field here. Moving into 1440p, we do see the same trend being shown here with about a 50 frame difference between the RX 7800 XT. On to 4K, we see a little bit more of an uplift, but don't be fooled by these numbers, ladies and gents, because 60 frames per second at 4K high is really good. Just as compared to a regular 4070, it's not as performant. On to Unigen Superposition. This one is highly GPU bound, despite it being 1080p. And you can see here that the 4070 laptop GPU is not that close to the performance of the 4070 desktop GPU. Again, 1440p custom with motion blur and depth of field disabled, same thing. And lastly, onto 4K optimize. Again, 60 frames per second-ish is not too bad. Here's a very interesting benchmark, Cyberpunk 2077. This one is using DLSS 3.5 in performance mode with ray tracing set to high. The main thing here is the Radeon cards are using FSR and ray tracing and, you know, DLSS is way more performant. That being said, with FSR, it's also set to performance mode here. And one thing that you'll probably notice with the 4070 laptop GPU as compared to a desktop card is the performance really isn't that different at 1440p. And if we jump on over to 4K, you'll be pleasantly surprised to see that the frame rate is exactly the same in 4K for both the desktop and the laptop GPU, but this isn't always the case because when we move over onto benchmarks like Horizon Zero Dawn, you can see the gap is absolutely massive. That's over 80 frames difference per second at 1080p. Jumping on over to 1440p, we're seeing the same kind of thing happening again, with the difference being more akin to 60 to 70 frames per second. And lastly, at 4K, we're seeing 49 frames per second, which is playable, but ultimately it's not optimal for a game like Horizon Zero Dawn. Next, on to Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3. This is using frame generation and using AMD's frame generation in comparison as well. And the performance here really isn't that bad. You gotta remember, this is with FSR and or DLSS turned on and you know, we're getting really good frame rates, like 88 frames per second at 4K ultra settings is really good. But remember, frame generation does add some latency. Here's something that might interest you, the power consumption on the NUC 970. This is entire system power consumption. This is both CPU and GPU power consumption combined and 140 watts at full tilt, well, 141 is quite good. Some CPUs won't even do that. In terms of Cinebench score here, you can see that we compared this to a bunch of CPUs that we've tested lately. And for the multi-core score, look, it's, it's not the best score in the world, but remember, this is a mobile chip that uses 65 watts of power. And when we take a look at stuff like the single core performance here, it's really not terrible. While the gaming performance is nowhere near as strong as a comparable RTX 4070 desktop GPU, I think it's still better than any other APU, but I can't help thinking that they could have just as easily strapped a desktop GPU onto the same PCB and had much better performance. I would almost go as far as saying that the thermal solution that I showed you guys earlier would probably be able to handle a desktop RTX 4070 without getting too overwhelmed. At this point, you're basically just buying a laptop with gaming laptop class performance without a screen for the exact same money. And it's not even that portable. I mean, two and a half liters, but also to be fair, I get the use case, small PC, big power. But I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say that for the enthusiasts, like most of you guys out there are, build a small form factor PC. It might cost you the same amount of money and you will get better performance. But for those out there who don't wanna build something, this would almost be worth considering, except for the fact that ASUS doesn't disclose anywhere that you're not getting a desktop class GPU. All of their marketing says it's an NVIDIA GeForce RTX 4060 or 4070 GPU. What they aren't telling you is that it's the laptop variant, which is significantly slower. 
If you don't believe me, I'll let Jared's tech explain it. Take it away, Jared. All right, so Nvidia has desktop and laptop versions of the RTX 4070. They've got the same name, so they must perform about the same, right? <laughs> no. Based on my testing, at 1440p, the desktop version of the 4070 reaches a 45% higher average FPS in a 23 game average. Now, don't get me wrong, the laptop version handles 1440p gaming at high settings no problem, but the desktop version with the same name destroys it. The laptop 4070 is actually closer in performance to the last gen RTX 3060 Ti desktop card, and that's because the laptop 4070 uses Nvidia's AD106 die, while the desktop version uses AD104, so they're completely different pieces of silicon, and that's why the desktop version has almost 28% more CUDA cores. 50% more memory, almost double the memory bandwidth, and double the maximum power limit. I mean, it makes sense that a desktop graphics card can use more power compared to a laptop. Desktop PCs just aren't as space constrained compared to a laptop or a NOC. The desktop version of the GPU just has more room for cooling. But those are some pretty big spec differences between two products with the same name. Well, almost the same name. Technically, the mobile version is actually called RTX 4070 Laptop GPU. But still, I think it's a bit misleading. I doubt most regular consumers would know what the difference is. But now, you do. Thanks, Jared. Make sure you go and subscribe to Jared's Tech as well, link in the description. The ROG NOC 970 has some cool features like three M.2 slots, but is it enough to justify the price? I gotta be honest with you guys, I'm not sure that it is. For the bundle that I got here with the 32 gigs of RAM and the one terabyte SSD, this is gonna set you back around 4,300 Aussie dollars. And in the US, it's around about 2,500 USD. I know for a fact that I could build a small form factor PC for less money and have way better performance. Look, I'll show you. This is a much more powerful system on PC Pop Pickle that I quickly whipped up. Look at the price here. 2,057 US dollars. This will outperform the ROG NUC 970 by a country mile, guys. Like, there is no competition here. Switching over to Australian dollars, $3,396. Again, exactly the same configuration. The power budget for a system like this is over 400 watts, but the Fractal Terra is such a small case that it makes it ultra portable. While you could argue that the ROG NUC 970 is only 2.5 liters and you can't build a small form factor PC that small, I don't think it matters. It's expensive for what it is. Well, I guess the search for that perfect living room PC continues.